Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is... What? What's the name of my channel? Oh, it's been a long day. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Keyways, splines, and other interior radial features on a bore seem like very difficult things to make, but I'm going to show you three ways you can make them in your home hobby machine shop with things you probably already have lying around. So let's go. What is a keyway and why should you care? Well, if you've got something big and heavy like this flywheel, it's just going to spin on the shaft. So what we do is we cut a keyway half in the shaft like this. That's easy. You just do that with an end mill. But then we need to continue that gap there up into the hub of the spinning thing. That is considerably more difficult because that feature has to be cut inside of a bore. So how do you do that? The quickest, easiest, and therefore most expensive way to do it is with one of these. This is a keyway broaching kit. This is used on the press. It comes with these little bushings here that go in the bore, one for each pair of key and bore size. Then there's the brooches themselves, one for each keyway size. It cuts the keyway in a series of increasing bites. And in fact, for larger keys, there's going to be multiple passes. You put a shim behind it after the first pass and do a second pass. And even larger keyways may have multiple shims. Let's do a little demo of this. I've got a piece of scrap here with a bore in it. I've got one of the bushings from the kit. I'll slide the bushing in there. Before you begin, make sure you've got room underneath for the brooch to pass all the way through the part, at least the teeth anyway, and make sure the brooch isn't going to fall on a concrete floor or something like that. You don't want the brooch to be damaged. Brooches are very hard. They're like taps, so they can shatter. Next, of course, lots and lots of cutting fluid for an operation like this. Then we just remove any cat hair that might be present, slide the brooch down in there to get it started, and then line it up under the ram on the press. Then just start pressing at home. I periodically release the ram to let the brooch straighten up. If something isn't perfectly straight and you keep pushing, the brooch is going to bend until it shatters, so you don't want that. And I should say that this is an eighth inch keyway brooch, and this is about the limit of a small two-ton hobbyist press like you see me using here. Anything larger than this, and you're definitely going to need a lot more press. This takes a surprising amount of force for how small these tools look like they are. If you need to, you can add a little spacer underneath to get a little more height to finish pushing that through. Sometimes even though the teeth are clear, you might need a little help to just push the rest of the shank of the tool through. Make sure to clean all the chips off the brooch between each pass. If there's chips between those teeth, the second pass will get very difficult indeed. There's the result of the first pass. You can see it's basically half the depth of the keyway, just getting started. So I'll put the bushing back in and we'll do the second pass. Normally you just leave the bushing in place, but I wanted to show you what it looks like so far. Then the shim goes in the back, and now we do pass number two the same way. Once again, don't underestimate how much force this takes. I'm using all of the two tons on this two-ton press. I've got the handle at full extension. I've got it clamped firmly to the bench, and I'm leaning on it with my body weight to get this down through here. It really does take quite a lot of force, even for a tiny little model scale sized keyway brooch like this. And there we have one tidy little keyway. That was very quick, very easy, and very expensive. If you look at the brooch now, you can see these lovely flat spiral chips that it makes. We'll be seeing more of these later. Aside from cost, are there any other downsides to this method? There sure are. The big one is that you need a custom bushing there for the center of the bore for every bore diameter and keyway size combination that you ever want to do and the bushing has to be at least as long as the bore or longer. Otherwise, the bottom of the brooch is not supported as it goes through, and chaos will ensue. So what that means is, when you use a keyway brooch, you pretty much are going to have to start by doing what I'm doing here, which is making a custom bushing for the center of your bore. 
In this case, I'm going to demonstrate putting an eighth inch keyway as before, but in a five eighths bore. And the kit, of course, didn't come with that combination because it only comes with three or four of those bushings and it's never the one that you need. I grabbed a chunk of garbage steel here off the junk pile and I turned down the OD to be a nice sliding fit in the bore. And I'm also just cleaning up the wider shoulder at the top there. There needs to be a bit of a shoulder as you saw on the commercial bushings. And then you want to undercut the shoulder here a little bit so that it'll sit down cleanly on the outside surface of the bore without getting wedged in there because of a fillet or a slight chamfer that you might have in there. Chamfer the end of course because chamfers are what separate us from the animals. And the finish on this garbage steel was making me sad so I took a little bit of emery paper to it and eh, now I'm 18% less sad I guess. Then we can part it off. As you can see it doesn't take too long to make one of these but you know you do have to make it so Factor that in if you're going to use keyway brooches a lot. And Yahtzee. Next I have to set it up in the mill. I'm using this little toolmaker's vise because it's got a nice v-groove jaw that makes it easy to hold a part like this in a way that gives me access to the full length of the part. If you don't have something like this, another way to do this would be to leave the stock long in the lathe that give you something to hold on to. And then you could hold this in a collet block or something like that in order to cut this groove down the entire length of the part. For the width and depth of this groove, you can just take measurements off of one of the commercial bushings that came in the kit. The depth will be dependent on the size of the brooch that came in your particular kit, and then the width is going to be a few thousandths wider than the brooch. In this case, I used a gauge block to determine the commercial brooch had a 129 thou gap there. So my single pass with the 8th inch end mill wasn't quite enough. So I just moved over a couple thou, did a side mill pass down one side, moved over the other way a couple thou, another side mill pass. And now that gauge block is a perfect fit. And we can test fit with the brooch itself as well. Make sure that's a nice easy sliding fit there. To demonstrate this custom bushing in action, here's the flywheel I showed at the top. That slides right in there. And then once again, here's that brooch. Lots and lots of cutting oil for the vitamins. And then we just push that down through. First one pass by itself. And then we put the shim in there and do a second pass. Well, that's all well and good. That clearly works fine, but is there another more perhaps hobby friendly way to do this without all the expensive tools? Yes, there is. We can start with this scrap of high speed steel here with a cutting shape ground on it by some grizzled old machinist. I have no idea. This was in a box of high speed steel scraps that I acquired from somewhere. And we are going to grind our own keyway cutting tool here. This is a very low budget and very flexible way to cut keyways, as well as internal splines, slits and collets, and all sorts of similar longitudinal bore features. If you don't have scraps of high speed steel, you can also use an old end mill or an old drill, something like that. Just make sure that it is high speed steel if you're going to use a regular grinder like this. If you've got an old carbide end mill, for example, you need a carbide grinder for that. This is the shape I'm aiming for here. There's a groove cutting profile here at the end with clearances around the back and the front. Just like you would use for a groove cutting tool on the lathe. There's what I ground up. It's far from perfect, but it goes to show that as long as the width of the nose is correct and you've got some kind of half-baked clearances behind it, in this case it's a combination of what I ground and what was already there from the previous tool grind, it'll still work great. You can get very beautiful features from unbeautiful tools in the machine shop. I didn't put much of a top rake on that, which maybe I should have because it's steel, but as you'll see, it's fine because of the light cuts that we're taking. I like to give a fresh ground tool a hone here as well. I want to make sure that the cutting edge there is nice and sharp to the touch in the direction that the tool will be cutting. So I'm looking for a nice sharp front edge there. Next up we need a mandrel to hold this little cutter. So I've got another piece of scrap steel here from the junk bin. And I'm going to chuck this up and we're going to quickly turn down a little mandrel here to hold this. The critical dimension here is the diameter of this mandrel. It has to be less than the diameter of the bore plus the depth of the keyway that you want to cut. We need to be able to fit the mandrel plus the full extension of the cutter required to reach final depth inside the bore. So that means your mandrel is going to be quite a bit smaller than the bore. And of course the length has to be sufficient to cover more than the full length of the bore that you're going to cut a keyway in. 
chant for the end, separate us from the animals, and I'm gonna drill and tap a little set screw in the end here. That's gonna hold the little piece of high-speed steel in place. Hopefully the form of this tool is starting to make sense now. We're done with the lathe, so over to the mill, and we're gonna drill a cross hole. You could also do this step in a drill press, of course, if you don't have a milling machine. The nice thing about the technique I'm gonna show you is that it does not require a mill at all. You can cut keyways on a lathe with this technique. Final step on this tool is to cut the little chunk of high-speed steel to length. It needs to fit entirely within the cross hole of the mandrel that we just made, so we're gonna need to cut it to length. I do this with a grinding disc on a rotary tool along with some coolant to keep anything from getting too hot. Don't try to cut high-speed steel blanks on any form of bandsaw or hacksaw. High-speed steel is harder than all your saws, so you definitely have to use some sort of grinding tool to cut these. A little test fit now, and you can see how the pieces go together. So I've got the cutting edge facing up because that's gonna be down when the tool is in use. And then get the little set screw in there and clamp it together. Now at this point, you may need to make some adjustments to your grind. In my case, you can see that the cutting edge has kind of a negative top rake on it because the top of it is not very flat. So I did some adjustments to the grind there. Once again, verifying the tool dimensions here, the mandrel needs to slide through there with the cutter at full extension, and the cutter needs to be extended enough that it can reach the full depth of the key slot, as you see there, just sort of test fitting on the one that I did with the brooch. With this tool made, we'll go to the second way to do a keyway, and that's here on the mill. So I've got the bore tappy tap tapped down, nice and flat and square there. To align that bore on the spindle, which is important, I'm just using a pin, but you could use any of the common methods for doing this. Then we take that cutter that we just made and we put it up in the spindle. I'm using a collet here. I suppose you could use a Jacob's chuck as long as the cutter was bottomed out in the top of the Jacob's chuck so that the jaws are not experiencing too much downward force. There is gonna be a fair amount of force in what we're about to do. So I like to use a collet for this. Then you wanna rotate the spindle so that the cutter is going to be tangent to the surface in there. And honestly, you can just do this by eye. If you wanted to be really fussy, you could put a gauge pin through that cross bore there and indicate that in to get it parallel to the x-axis of the mill, but honestly, eyeballing this is close enough. Then apply lots of lots of cutting fluid for the vitamins. Then I'm gonna touch off the cutter by moving the x-axis over a little bit at a time until I feel that cutter dragging on the inside of the bore and away we go. So all we're doing is pushing it down through the work with the quill, and then after each pass, advance the cutter a little bit on X. Now, little bit is the operative word there. A one thou cut is the absolute most you wanna do. I'm aiming for between five tenths and one thou on each pass. For even a small keyway like this, you're looking at more than 100 passes probably, but it really doesn't take that much time. You get into kind of a rhythm, and if you accidentally try to take too much of a bite, you'll know pretty quickly because you won't be able to push the cutter through with the quill. You don't have a whole lot of leverage there with the quill, so the process is fairly self-limiting in that way. In this wider shot, you can see that I'm really not using very much force. Like that's pretty casual arm motion you're seeing there. And that's really all you should be using. Like I can feel the tool cutting, but I'm not having to lean on it with my body weight or anything. If you're needing to do that, if you're taking cuts that heavy, you're definitely abusing the little rack and pinion in your quill. And you don't wanna be doing that. Again, it's not designed for high forces. So just take your time and be patient. Now, what's really great about this method is that, of course, you can cut any depth of keyway, as you can imagine, but we can also easily widen this keyway if we need to. After you reach full depth, you can do more passes by moving the Y a little bit and widen out the keyway. So with a single tool, we can cut any size or shape of keyway that you might need, which is a lot more flexible than those brooches are. For final depth, if you don't have a keyway brooch to compare to like I'm doing, you can check in Machinery's Handbook, and for a given bore and keyway size, it will tell you how deep it should be. Or if you have the key stock on hand, you can test fit with that. As you can see, that's indistinguishable from the fancy expensive brooch method that we just used. It works very, very well with very little equipment. But wait, I don't have a mill, you say? You can still do this. You can do it on the lathe. Don't ever try to tell a lathe what it can't do. Yeah, you can cut this keyway on a lathe as well. And it's really the same process. 
I'm going to start once again with this tool that we just made and in this case I'm going to put it in the tool post. You could use a boring bar holder for this or I'm using a v-groove tool holder as you see here. You want to get that tool horizontal parallel to the bed of the lathe but again you can honestly do that by eye if you wanted to be fussy. Again you could put a gauge pin through that bore on the tool and indicate it in but honestly I think doing it by eye is good enough for most keyways. Then to get the tool height set right, once again, you could get all fancy about this or just do it by eye by feeding the tool into the bore. And then what I'm doing is comparing the gap above and below center line between the tool and the bore there. And I'm just adjusting the height until those gaps are even. And honestly, again, doing that by eye is good enough. Just like on the mill now, I touch off by moving the cross slide out towards the near side of the bore there till I feel it starting to drag. Then lots and lots of cutting fluid for the vitamins and I feed in a little bit on the cross slide and away we go. So it's really the same process that we used on the mill except now I'm feeding the depth with the cross slide and I'm feeding the tool through with the carriage hand wheel. Now you have a little bit less leverage here than you do on the mill. I mean unless your carriage hand wheel is a lot bigger than mine maybe. But again between half a thou and one thou depth of cut is no problem. If you're doing more than that and it's hard work, then you're probably stressing the feed gear on your carriage a lot more than you want to. So if it's hard work, then take lighter cuts and just be patient. I don't have a DRO on my lathe, so I'm measuring the depth of each pass with my cross slide hand wheel there. Each tick mark there is two thou of diameter reduction or one thou depth of cut. So I just go between half and one tick mark each pass. That's quite easy to do. And if you wanted to measure a really accurate depth, you could also put an indicator on the cross slide there, which would also tell you when you've reached your final depth. In my case, I'm just eyeballing it for this demonstration. But once again, it's just in and out and in and out. Oh, behave. You might be wondering how I'm keeping the spindle from rotating while doing this, both on the mill and the lathe. And the answer is I'm doing a big fat nothing at all. Because all the force is towards the bearings, there's really nothing that's causing it to try and rotate. So as long as you're careful not to touch the spindle or the chuck while you do this, it honestly doesn't rotate. And once you've got a bit of a cut started, it's going to self-align on each pass. Now in this case, I'm using a DC lathe, which has permanent magnets in it. So I start with the motor in one of its natural magnetic kind of notches that it has and that holds it pretty reasonably still. But if you wanted to, you could also rig up some sort of spindle lock on the mill or the lathe for doing this just to be certain. Here's those beautiful spiral chips again. The tool that we made makes chips just as nice as the fancy expensive tool. And that little shaper style tool only took about 45 minutes to make. Well, there you go. That's three easy ways to make keyways in a hobby shop. And if you're looking at that finished piece and thinking, hey, that kind of looks like the beginnings of a spline. You are not wrong. You can absolutely make splines and other more complex internal bore features the same way. You just have to add the additional component of some way to index, either an indexing tooth on your lathe chuck or an indexing head on your mill, something along those lines. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little demonstration of how to cut keyways, and I hope you learned something useful. Thanks to my patrons who make all this content possible, and I will see you next time.